I'm Jasper Williams, Pastor Emeritus of Salem Bible Church East and West, East in Lithonia, Georgia, and of course West in Atlanta on Baker Road. I'm delighted to have this opportunity of coming to you once again with our telecast. For years now, you have supported our ministry, and for that, I am indeed grateful. I want to break in with uh, the norm being distorted to some degree today because we are fastly approaching our conference. It is called the ACTS Conference, A-A-C-T-S, acronym for African American Churches Transforming Society. This conference will be held at the east side location in Lithonia on March the 13th through the 15th, and we're asking all of you to attend, most especially our pastors in the metropolitan area of Atlanta. We have taken upon ourselves the initiative to invite pastors not only from metropolitan Atlanta, but across the state of Georgia and also across the United States of America, our country of which we all are privileged to live. I want to say that uh, one of the things that differentiates this conference from most other conferences is that I have attended conferences whereby I left the same way I came. I didn't take anything away. I didn't have any information that was any more than I had when I went. It was sort of discouraging and disappointing. But I want you to know that this is a conference whereby I promise you, with everything that is in and of myself and my inner being, you will not leave this conference as you came. You're going to have physical information put into your hands that will give you directions, like blueprints for the do's and the don'ts, what you do, what it is that you don't do. You'll have that when you leave. We're going to be dealing, I personally, with the pastors, uh, showing us as pastors how it is that we turn black America around from our pulpits and an actual blueprint of how to do that, how to preach and teach it into our churches, how to get our churches motivated to wanting to do it as well as implemented it exactly as to how it is to be done. All of that, pastors will be with me in workshops starting on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, it's time out for talk. Uh, our organization started immediately after Michael Brown was, was killed by a local police officer in Ferguson, Missouri on August the 9th in 2014. It was at that time that the Lord led me and spoke to me and said that something must be done about the direction that black America was going in. You remember we saw all of the looting and all of the protesting and many of us were embarrassed by what we saw even though we empathized and sympathized with having lost one of our own at the hands of law enforcement. And so we began our organization then. We started talking as pastors among ourselves. We started doing this, that, and the other. So we have talked and talked and talked and talked. I'm saying it's time now for us to stop the talk and to start the walk. In other words, it's time for us to walk what it is that we have talked, and the black church is to take the lead in this. Why do I say the black church is to take the lead? The black church is to take the lead simply because it really is the only viable institution that we have in the black community. And I think that much of the reason as to why we've had such a downward, decadent, road in the African-American community is because far too long now, the church has been silent. And so we're going to be having workshops for pastors 
across denominational and religious lines whereby we will be giving you these directions. Simultaneously with me teaching and working with the pastors, there would be workshops congruent with our workshop for pastors. Pastors will be bringing their leaders. Pastors will be bringing people who will be implementing their social programs in their churches. And you too will have uh, different workshops that will be going on. You're going to be dealing with things like how do I create and develop community collaboratives? In other words, how do I get key people to the table in order that wherever my church is, I'm able to get those who are around and about my church to sit down at the table and become a partner in turning our communities around? Wherever any church is located, there are certain things that the church from within itself can do and ought do. And we're going to be teaching and showing your people that you bring on your teams, pastors, as to how this is to be done and what is to be done. The key to everything that we're talking about in this conference is how the black church has got to begin investing in our young people, in our youth. We've got to create a resilience in our young people in this 21st century. And I say that because the society of which we live, we are allowing our children to run wild like runaway child. And it's time for us to get a handle on it. Nobody can do anything with our kids. As it relates to the schools, our teachers, our principals are having problems. Uh, we have all kind of problems with law enforcement. And it all roots back to parenting. Parenting. We've got to give our children good parenting. So what do we do? How do we do that? This conference is designed to where workshops will be going on at the same time that I'm working with pastors and preachers of the gospel, that would be professionals working with people who you bring from your churches, showing them how to create these community collaboratives. We also will have a four hour workshop on how to get grants. Uh, we as ACTS in the last year or so have been privileged to get over a half million dollar grant that helps us with what we're doing as it relates even to this workshop. And we want to share that. Too many times we are very selfish about what we do and who we tell as it relates to how we succeed and how we gain those successes. Whereby if we share with each other, it means that we tend to expand and are more successful on a wider range. And so how to get those grants and what you are to do to get those grants, you will walk away in your hand, ABC, one, two, three approaches as to the do's and don'ts, what you do in order to be able to aggrandize yourselves going further. Another thing that would be going on in our conference will be financial aid for our kids. In other words, not only student loans are the only way, which is a, the way that our kids get student loans through the government, but it puts them in positions to where when they start out in life, they are in debt. Well, we have ways now whereby we can teach and show that we can get aid for going to schools and grants and scholarships that can help minimize those costs so that it does not impact the kids once they start out in life. And so all of these kinds of things are things that we're wanting to do in this conference and we all need to participate. We all need to be a part. Every day there will be foods served at our conferences uh, on site. Uh, meals would be provided for everyone. 
We would have special evening services on that Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock and then also on that Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. I will be preaching on that Thursday evening. You will see the agenda as to who will be teaching and preaching the various hours and all of the experts who will be coming. So it's really designed for everybody to get up, step up, pep up, and come. I wanted to take this time to talk about the conference. We're going to the pulpit now, and you are hearing me for the past few weeks talk about the theme, uh, Parenting God's Way. Parenting God's Way. Our emphasis is to show how we, the church, can put emphasis on our kids, on our babies, on our children. And if we do that, it helps to turn the race around. That's what we need more than anything else now. Black America needs to invest in its children in a pro-positive way. And there is no better way than to do that through parenting. And so we're going now to the pulpit to where I was privileged to preach a part of this series, Parenting God's Way parenting God's way. We're going to share these messages even with our pastors when you come and all are invited to be a part. We're going to the pulpit now for the few moments that we have remaining and then I shall return, come back with you and give you again directions about how to enroll, register for this conference. Everybody needs to get enrolled, registered for this conference back to the pulpits. I'll see you in a few moments. Thank you. I'm talking today as I continue about parenting God's way. This is part two, and it covers chapters two through four of First Samuel, chapters two through four. My subtopic is one that is certainly one of the disparities and ills of our race, and it deals with the passiveness of fatherhood. I'm talking about Eli, the passive parent, the passive parent. Let me begin by performing an autopsy on Eli, if I may. This corpse that is before us, imaginatively speaking, is the corpse of a father who failed with the raising of his two sons. This father's name is Eli. This father's occupation is high priest and judge of all Israel. If I have to give a physical description in one word of his life, I would have to say he's overweight. He dies at the old age of 98. The cause of his death is a broken neck that he suffered when he fell backwards in a faint because he had heard bad news about the deaths of his two sons. Please note that Eli had many, many excellent character qualities about himself. He was a moral, conscious man. In his long life, you would not find anywhere in his record that he was guilty of any terrible sin. Eli did not drink, he did not steal, he did not swear, no, Eli did not lie. There's nowhere where he ever tried to divorce his wife, there's no evidence of him ever committing the sin of adultery, there's no evidence that Eli ever abused either or both of his sons, all the way up to the day that he died. He was deeply concerned about the things of God. So Eli was a good man. Eli was a man, however, who failed. Question, why did Eli fail? He failed because he was a passive parent. He failed because he was a do-nothing dad. Here it is in 1 Samuel chapter 3, the background of this chapter. Uh, God had brought Samuel. You remember the story about Hannah when she thought that her womb was barren, that she would never be able to give birth to a child. 
And she went to the tabernacle at Shiloh and was praying at the altar that God would give her a man child. And she promised, Lord, if you give me one, I promise I'll give him back to you when he is of age. And sure enough, God blessed her to have a fruitfulness in her womb. She gave birth to a man child, named him Samuel, and when he was about three years of age, she brought him to God and gave him to this high priest, Eli, and Eli had mentored this young man, and he grew up to become the next judge, the next high priest of the tabernacle at Shiloh. And here he is, a young man now, and God is talking to him, Samuel, the prophet, telling him why he's getting ready to move Eli off the scene and what is expected of him as the next prophet. And so he speaks to him in verse 13 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. For I have told him, in other words, I have told Eli that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he, the dad, restrained them not. So what is it that made God so mad? How and why did God become so peeved about this man, Eli? Not so much what Eli did that made God mad. It was what Eli was that peeved God off, if you will. He was a weak man. He was a passive parent. He was, in simple terms again, a do-nothing dad. Amen. A do-nothing dad. And so why do I call him passive? This is why we say he's passive because of 1 Samuel chapter 2, this time in verse 17, tells us why Daddy Eli was passive. Verse 17 says, Wherefore the sin of the young men, in other words, the sin of your young sons, was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred, the offering of the Lord. This is saying that Eli's sons, and to give their names, Hophni and Phileas, were despising God and his commands and how they were handling their priestly duties. Because these two boys, like their father, <laughs> were priests as well. And so they were taking in the sacrifices that the people brought they were priests, but they were maliciously, in a roundabout way, stealing from God's house through the sacrifices that God's people brought. Amen. They were stealing the sacrifices. The Mosaic Law had given ABC 123 defined guidelines for what the priests were supposed to have of the sacrifices. But they were doing more than that. They would stick their fork in the pot, pull up the meat that they would eat. And that was stealing. And to steal, to take from that which belonged to God was an offense to God worthy of death. Somebody had to pay for it by dying. And so Hophni and Phidias, these two sons of Eli, were in open rebellion against God. These sons of Eli robbed God. That's one reason why Daddy Eli is classified as a passive parent, as a do-nothing dad. But in addition to all of that, if stealing from the Lord's house, from the sacrifices that God's people brought is not enough, there were even more sins that this sorry dad was guilty of in not bringing up to his children. And here it is still in 
1 Samuel chapter 2. Here's the other thing that they were doing in verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. In other words, in addition to stealing the wrong sacrifices that God's people had brought, these scoundrels, rascals, whatever you want to call them, sons of the priest who were priests themselves, would meet the women at the door of God's house and force them into sex acts as they came to the temple, as they left going away from the temple. Oh my God, how can a priest of God raise such weak, wicked, despicable children and feel still call themselves priests? Obviously, Eli, ladies and gentlemen, did wrong, felt bad, because when he finds out about it, like you, like me, when, when our children do not come up to the standards that we feel they ought come, that when our children disappoint us in their acts and in their actions, oftentimes as parents we find ourselves asking, what did I do wrong? Amen. Where did I go off? Maybe I'm the only parent in here who has had to ask, where did I go wrong? What did I do so bad? But God held Eli, oh God Jesus, accountable for the sins of his children. Amen. And if I need to bring it to where you are in your seats today, God is holding you and you and you and you and you and me Amen. accountable for the sins of our children. Oh, God, keep my mind, Jesus. I'm out here waiting in this water all by myself because they ain't nobody saying nothing. Just me, me and you, Jesus. <laughs> and so Eli did bad and Eli went wrong because Eli was a passive parent, a weak man, a do-nothing dad. Obviously, Eli's passivity and his passiveness as a parent started when his babies were just that, babies. Started when these young men were nothing but children. When they were nothing but boys. It had to have begun when they were very small. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13. Again, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which knoweth because the sons, his sons, made themselves vile. Amen. His sons became wicked. They became sinful, taken out of the Lord's coffer. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I'm sorry to break into the telecast. I know you're into it, but I want to talk a little bit more about the conference. For those of you who have just tuned in, I talked at the beginning of this telecast about our conference that we're having on March the 13th through the 15th, and everybody's invited. Most especially our preachers and pastors who will be in a workshop with me. I'm going to be sharing with you the do's and the don'ts the things that we've done that have worked, what does not work. In other words, it's time to stop talking about what black America needs to do. And it's time now for us to start walking, demonstrating, doing what it is that black America needs to do. I, I talked about that I myself will be providing you as pastors with a blueprint that you will walk away in your hand, which will be an ABC one, two, three steps that you do to change your church's formats uh, so that it becomes an institution 
whereby people begin to have church not as we are accustomed to having, but church that we need to have because of the different needs that we are experiencing we have in this 21st century as it relates to our churches. And only when we share with each other our successes do we help each other. And that's one of the things that is driving me to really, really want to get this conference into the lifeblood of us in the metropolitan area of Atlanta. Along with me, that will also be congruent workshops for other people. If you have people on your team, let's say you only have one person that you can bring who is in charge of the social ministries of your church, that one person will be able, according to our scheduling, to attend three different workshops in the three, two days that we have as it relates to our conference. So it's going to be a fact-finding, carrying away tools and blueprints for the do's and the don'ts. How to take control of our children in our churches, helping them to get a format, helping them to change their mode and the way they think in this society in which we live. And therefore, once we can touch our kids through parenting, parental involvement, what parents should and should not do, if we can get that over, we begin to see some change as it relates to our race. I was hurt back some several years ago with all of the different disparities that we were seeing from the protest. And I know it's time for a change. Not only do I know, you know, and we can change. We can change black America. Come join me now. Everybody get up, step up, pep up. If you're interested in knowing how to register, go to ACTS, A-A-C-T-S, conference.com. That's ACTS, A-A-C-T-S, conference.com. See you at the conference. Be blessed. Welcome to Salem.